Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce to you today Sharon Eubank. Having grown up in Battle for Utah, the Eubank name is very iconic, um, primarily because her father was a weatherman on TV for many years. And Mark, I have to say welcome, and Jean, welcome today. Um, I still count the uh, the seconds between lightning bolts and thunder when they happened because Mark came and taught that to my fifth grade class at West Bountiful Elementary years ago. Um, so I learned a lot from this family. But more importantly, in Bountiful, Utah, is the iconic name of the Eubanks uh, really due to their service. And I think that you'll feel that today in all that Sharon has to say. Um, I think the world of this family, and Sharon has patterned her life after service. Um, she was hired by LDS Welfare Services in 1998 to help church members find resources to start businesses. Uh, Sharon helped establish international employment offices and create a training workshop for entrepreneurs. She currently manages the LDS Humanitarian Wheelchair Program for the church, uh, covering areas of the Middle East and Africa. Previously, previously, she had owned an educational toy store here in Provo. I believe it was called the Red Balloon, right? Um, for many years, she spent Christmas Eve consulting with Santa Claus on the hottest new toys and helping out the children in the area. She was a legislative aide for the senators, for Senators Alan Simpson, a representative of Wyoming, and Jake Garn, representative of, of Utah and Washington, D.C., until Senator Garn's retirement. Following a finished mission and a degree in English from BYU Provo, uh, Sharon taught English to Japanese junior high school students in Suzuka, Japan. Uh, will you join with me, please, in a warm welcome to Sharon Eubank. I have to say that um, after I heard the other people that are coming to speak and that my parents also came to watch me, I feel a little bit nervous. And I hope that you'll be nice to me when the time comes to ask, her, uh, to ask some questions and make me look good in front of my parents, which I would do for you <laughs> if I were in the audience. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be in the Kennedy Center. I have some friends uh, here at BYU. I've uh, worked with some programs here, and I'm very pleased to be back and talk about uh, the work that we're doing in humanitarian services. I titled this uh, talk, Please Don't Tell This Story, because what I'd really like to focus on in this isn't what humanitarian service is, but what are the principles behind telling the story of humanitarian service and not telling the story of humanitarian service, which I think often gets um, obscured in some of the enthusiasm we have for the humanitarian projects themselves. Before I go any further, I, let me just start out by telling three stories. The first one is, there was a soldier from American Fork, Utah, who was serving in Iraq, and he was with his unit in a transport, and they were hit by a roadside bomb, and he was killed. And his family in American Fork wanted to do something, and so they collected different kinds of humanitarian aid. They made arrangements to have it shipped over to Iraq. And then uh, his unit helped distribute this aid in the exact neighborhood where the roadside bomb went off, which I think is a remarkable story. One of those things that was in that tra and the container was a wheelchair. They got the wheelchairs from the church. And this is a picture that was sent back to us, the, this little boy who had stepped on a landmine and had his leg blown off at the knee is being given his first ride in that wheelchair, which I think is a great picture. Here's the second story. This man's name is Robert Campbell, and he's a famous soccer or football player in Jamaica. He played for the national team, and he actually made quite a lot of money because every time they win, they pay the players, which was very helpful to both him and his family because not only this family that's with him, but his extended family was all living off of what he did. When he wasn't playing football, he had a taxi service that he was able to buy the, the two cars that he had with the proceeds that he got from playing football. One night after a game, he had, was coming out of the stadium, and they call them teeths, but I think it means toughs in Jamaica. They, they assaulted him, and they shot him 12 times, and they stole his taxi, and they left him for dead. It took him seven months in a rehab hospital, and he was finally allowed to come home. He's paralyzed. And... Uh, one of the social workers came to his house and said, there's a donation of wheelchairs that's coming. You qualify, and I want to do some measurements and see if we can get one that fits you. And then a couple weeks later, she came back with the chair and the humanitarian couple that held help provide the donation, and they uh, provided the chair for him. As he got interested in the couple that was there and he chatted with them, uh, he looked up the church and talked to the sister missionaries in Jamaica, and later on, several months later, he and his family joined the church. This is a picture of their baptism. I keep going wrong. 
The last story I wanted to tell you, although this is not a picture of the event, was uh, there was a wheelchair distribution, and I'm sorry I keep talking about wheelchairs, but I'm familiar with those because it's part of my work. There was a wheelchair distribution in a Latin American country, and for the way they did it was they used young elders and sisters that were serving missions to help assemble the chairs, take them out of the boxes and put the foot rests on and get them all, but it was several blocks away from the venue where the distribution was going to take place. And in their enthusiasm, the, the missionaries and whoever was helping them decided, let's bring the recipients down to this place where we've assembled the chairs, we'll put them in the chairs, and then we'll get them up to the venue, we'll have the missionaries give them a ride, and they'll push them up this road to where the big distribution is going to take place. And as this was happening, of course, crowds gathered, and the missionaries decided, well, let's sing. And so they started to sing Call to Serve, and they're pushing people in these wheelchairs up the road, and they're singing Call to Serve. And somebody thought, well, hey, there's all these people on the side of the road. So they passed out pass-along cards and literature. And, and anyway, they, they, you know, you can just see how this evolved with missionaries and their enthusiasm. This is in Korea, just in case you want to know. <laughs> But I put the picture in here because uh, I'll talk about it later on, but they're, they're waving these American flags. There are four questions, basically, that I hope to answer in this talk. And the first one is, why does the church do humanitarian work? The second one is, should the right hand know what the left hand is doing? The third one is, what role does media play in humanitarian work? And the fourth one is, which story should we tell and which stories should we not? So the primary purpose that the church does humanitarian work in this age or in any age is because we believe in a God whose son came to save the world in love and uh, we should act in kindness and in love and in concern that's sincere toward other people. And basically that the whole spirit of what we believe, our testimonies of the gospel, permeates not just what we preach but what we do, the kinds of people that we are. And in our doctrine, we believe that our salvation is somehow inextricably tied with the salvation of other people, and not just people in our church, but everybody in the world. And so we are commanded that our salvation has to do with how we look after the poor and the needy, and that's the reason the church does humanitarian work. We hope that we do it in a way that shows that we're Christian and that we believe in Christian principles, but we're going to do the work anyway, whether people believe we're Christians doing it or not. That's not the reason we do the work. We will do it regardless. Should the right hand know what the left hand is doing? You can't tie the proselyting work that we believe in and we actively do to the humanitarian work that we also actively believe in and do. Because if you do, it becomes, it loses its credibility. It becomes tainted in a way that we can't, it can't be sustained. And after a while, we won't have access and we won't be able to do humanitarian work if it's seen as a vehicle for us to proselyte. And so those two things have to stay separate in the church. It's, it's one of the, the main principles. Uh, and there can't be any strings attached when we give humanitarian aid. And, and hopefully when we do it right, there aren't any strings attached. What role does the media play in humanitarian work? Although we're going to do it regardless and we are not going to tie it to proselyting work, there is this byproduct of notice that happens when you're doing some of this work. It just happens in the world. And so we have to delicately manage the byproduct of the attention that comes. We want to make sure that it's the right kind of attention. And I often think about Jesus and the miracles that he did. And sometimes he would tell the person, go your way and don't tell anybody that I did this. And other times he would perform this, this miracle in the front of everybody in a synagogue and it was for the glory of God and what were the principles I think about this a lot what were the principles guiding when he did that and when he did something different and what are the principles that should guide our projects and that's what I, I hope to discuss here today uh, just a little bit I want to go back to these three pictures this story is a wonderful story. And the things that happened between that American Fork community and the community in Baghdad where they uh, presented the, the aid and just the little interaction that's going on here, that's a great story. But I got this picture, and I'm breaking the rule because I'm showing it to you, but I can't use this picture anywhere. Can anybody tell me why? Say it loud. Visually, when you look at this picture, we are tying this humanitarian aid to the US military who's giving it. And we can't afford to do that. The church has to remain neutral. And it can't be tied to the US military or any military. When we do projects in Israel, we have to be careful that we do equal amounts of projects or we pay attention to the Palestinians and the Israelis. 
or we pay attention to Christians or Muslims or Christians and Hindus because we have to make sure that we maintain neutrality so that we have access to continue to do projects. When we gave these wheelchairs, I went down to the humanitarian center and I had to take a little seam ripper and cut off the embroidery that says, this is a gift from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, on the backs of all of those. On, in the hygiene kits, there's a little insert that says, this is from the church. We took all of those out, trying to protect this tie that would be made between the LDS church and the U.S. military that we had to protect. So I'm showing you this picture, but it's the only place it's ever going to be shown. I can't show this picture anywhere else. And there's a reason why we don't, we want to tell this story. It's, it's a great story, but we're never going to tell it because of the tie, and we have to maintain that neutrality. Robert Campbell, in an audience like this with members of the church, the most interesting part of that story, he got all excited. He was depressed from his injury. He didn't think his life was worth living. When he heard the gospel, he recognized, I can be a father. I can hold the priesthood. I can still, even though I can't support my family, I can actively participate in my family. And we respond to that as members of the church. That's the most interesting part of that. He joined the church. But if we tell that story in a different audience, what's the tie that we make? It, we're basically tying the humanitarian aid to the proselyting. In other words, I don't know all the basis. I don't know everything that happened in that story. And probably it was just a little ruse to get Robert Campbell interested in the church. And people don't know the difference between that, and they can't tell that. And when we reinforce those kinds of stories, even though they're so interesting to us, when we tell them in the media, we reinforce the idea that this is part of our proselyting, and it's not. And same thing with those missionaries in that Latin American country, you know, they were so excited and it just evolved at the time. But you, imagine if you're one of those people lining the streets and you're watching these people you've never seen before in name tags and shirts, pushing people with disabilities in these brand new wheelchairs up the street and they're singing, called to serve him, heavenly king of glory, chosen heir to witness for his name. If you don't have any background in the church, what does that sound like to you? And how'd they get those chairs anyway? Did they have to join the church? And you probably think so because somebody handed you a pass-along card as you were looking at the whole event. And so we can't make those kinds of ties. They have to stay separate, and that's, that's one of the principles. One of the principles that we do want to talk about is that the church teaches in its culture and in its members to be civic-minded, to care about each other, to do things, to volunteer, the spirit of volunteerism, I can't tell you how many times I take people on a tour of the Humanitarian Center or Welfare Square, and they're from different government agencies or they're from abroad, and they say, they take me aside and they say, how are you getting these people to volunteer? And we say, they just, they just volunteer. But do you pay them? No, we don't pay them. Do you give them a little like incentive or there's like buttons or pins or what do you do to get these people to do this kind of consecrated work? They'll say, somebody just told me they work 30 hours a week. This is practically a full-time job. I don't know how to describe why members of the church volunteer. It comes directly out of their hearts, and it's because of their testimonies. <clears throat> but this volunteer, the spirit of being in the community and being willing to work for the good of the community, not just for members of the church, not just for our family, but for us as a community as a whole, is part of the spirit of being a member of the church. And we want to we nurture that culture. And we teach it to our kids, and we take them places to, to learn how to do volunteerism. And, and by the time we're 65 years old, we think it's the best thing in the world to go out to some country that we've never heard of in a language we don't know and work with the people for 18 months or two years. And that's part of our culture. And people don't understand that, but they respond to the spirit of it. And members of the church can be catalysts in the community by helping other people to have the spirit of volunteerism. The fourth principle I want to talk about is Oh, I just I show you this picture too. This is a service project in Los Angeles between the local mosque and the local stake. And they were putting together hygiene kits that went to Iraq. But I love this picture of these people interacting together and they never would have interacted before. They said, we've lived in the same local community and we never knew each other. So it's just a picture of that. Okay, I love this picture. I didn't take this picture and I don't know who this family is, but you tell me what he feels like right now. <laughs> They're putting together some kind of kits for a welfare project. But this is the principle. There are no benefactors and there are no victims in church humanitarian work because the church principle is everybody is alike. 
And the boy that is there with his family who's learning about giving his time and putting kits together and, and sacrificing something he would have preferred to do on that day, at the end of the day, he's going to have learned something good. And it's going to benefit him in his life. And it may be more valuable than the boy someplace else in the world who opens up that hygiene kit. I don't know who is the biggest benefactor in that situation, but it happens over and over and over again. There are no benefactors and victims. There are no recipients, really. Everybody's a recipient who participates in this work. It teaches us about humility, about interacting with people, about self-reliance, about pride. And we all learn those things together as we do these kinds of projects. They won't let me do this again because I can't do the buttons. <laughs> this is a picture of President Hinckley. I think, this is my own personal opinion, but I think President Hinckley was probably the best thing that ever happened to the church as far as a public relations standpoint because he prepared his whole life and he loved to be open. He spent hours every day in his schedule spending time developing relationships with the press, with local and community leaders, with world leaders, and he was masterful at developing these relationships. He wasn't afraid of the press. He went on national television. He put himself out there. He answered hard questions. And because of that, the church gained quite a bit of credibility, and people got better information and knowledge about the church than they had previously. And I believe in the time of his administration, church members started to feel like they were mainstream. We were part of the mainstream culture, and maybe that was the first time the church had ever felt like that in the modern age. But there have been some recent events that have shown the church that perhaps we aren't as mainstream as we thought we were. And uh, Mitt Romney's campaign and the reaction against that is one of them. I think the Warren Jeffs trial, and I got a note from some people in Kazakhstan that were asking us, are, are you part of that church with the hairdos and the long skirts? In Kazakhstan, they somehow know about Warren Jeffs and are making that link between the fundamentalist church and the, the mainstream LDS church. And uh, I also think Proposition 8, you know, as, as uh, the church was singled out for the, uh, the work that they did there and some of the reaction against that. And so you will see probably in the future, the church making a little bit of a bigger effort to define its story and tell why it's doing some of the things it has done. In the past, we haven't made a big deal for a lot of years about a lot of the work that we've done, just because right hand doesn't need to know what the left hand is doing. But in doing that, we have allowed our detractors to define us in the media. And so there will be a greater effort to tell our story on our own terms. And there's, there's reasons for that. And I want to talk about some of the reasons later on today. Humanitarian work is basically divided into two kinds, and this is the one that most people associate with the LDS Church. It's the emergency response. This is a picture of the recent California fires, and you'll see there's a very big media component to all of these kinds of projects. They're all wearing those helping hands shirts, and you'll see those all over the world now. They have become a signature mark of people helping in disasters, and there's some good reasons for it. It allows people access into restricted areas. They know that they're part of a volunteer team. It creates recognition for the church, allowing them to help in other disasters. The church wants to become a first responder. And we can become a first responder because of the resources that we have. We not only don't have to uh, go out and fundraise the way a lot of charitable organizations have to when there's an emergency. The funds are already available. And the goods have already been stockpiled in different places around the world and the country. But the church also has this immediate network of wards and stakes, branches and districts, that are willing to volunteer and, and be organized. And hardly anybody else has these immediate volunteers that are ready to do that. So the church wants to build up its reputation for being a first responder. And so they put quite a bit of media attention into these kinds of things so that when there is a disaster, because the church has resources to help, people need to know about that. Governments need to know about that. Communities need to know so that we can offer our resources in the very beginning when other organizations are trying to get up and going. That's the greatest resource we have in emergency response. So this is for the Pisco Peru earthquake. You can see the cathedral there that was, and this is in the stake center, and they've got members of the community and others, but they're putting together food kits and hygiene kits uh, for the people in that community right next door. And they're responding within 12 hours of the earthquake which is one of the greater things that the church can do as a relief organization. Lots of times in the media you'll see these kinds of lists. 
5,000 LDS volunteers, 45,000 donated hours of service, 84,000 pounds of food, 20,000 hygiene kits, and you'll see these kinds of pictures. And there's a, there's a purpose for doing that kind of media because the church wants to generate this recognition that if there's a disaster, call on us. We have the resources, we have the people, and we can help. And you've heard those accounts that we all love in the church news and some of the other ones of people saying, oh, we recognize the, the, the boys and the girls in their yellow T-shirts. And, you know, suddenly our, ch- our yard was swarmed with people in yellow T-shirts cutting down trees. It's that kind of story that the church wants to tell so that they have access to do these things in the future. We don't expect that anybody joins the church from any of this thing. I don't think that anybody probably joined the church from having people with helping hands come and cut down their trees. But it generates positive response for the church, and it changes people's awareness of what the church is like. This was a letter that came. It says, uh, I was hoping you could forward a great big thank you to all the members of the LDS who have been working so hard in my neighborhood to help us rebuild our community. Your fellow Mormons have been there constantly with meals, hugs, prayers, and helping to repair and clear property. You have healed hearts and repaired homes in San Diego Hills. Please accept a heartfelt thank you on behalf of my family. And those kinds of things generate just a positive image of church members doing the kind of church work that the, is, is encouraged. And so this kind of awareness is helpful in the church, and so you'll see the media cover those kinds of events, and it's on purpose. The other kind of work that the church does is not in response to a, a big headline-grabbing emergency. It has to do with slow-burn chronic problems that exist for a long time and, and probably will for a long time. They have a lower profile, but the main reason the church is doing this kind of work, it's not about the stuff that they give away or the things that they do. It's about helping communities interact with each other in a positive way that actually helps them become a better community. So you've got these quilts, and oftentimes the story in the media will be 30,000 quilts donated. And... Sure, sure they tell that, because we often will tell that as part of our emergency response. But the bigger story in these kinds of projects isn't that 30,000 quilts got donated. It's the fact that women from that community sat around together and quilted those quilts over a six-month period and made a bunch of friends. And next time when they need quilts, they don't have to go to anybody else. They already know how to do this, and they are able to solve some of their own problems. Now, quilts might not be a good example. But this is Sri Lanka uh, after the tsunami. And these are women that belong to a women's organization that teaches literacy, but they were completely swamped by the tsunami wave. I mean, that's a terrible pun, and I'm sorry. But everybody was. They didn't know. They didn't know what to do next. And these women, because of the organization that they had already been part of, they had these skills where they talked to each other, and they, they brainstormed together, and they decided, well, these are the things that we need. These are the things that we have. These are the things we need help with. And they came out with those kinds of skills. The projects that the church does in these kinds of communities are all about building the self-reliance of people. It doesn't really matter in the end what they decide to do. It matters the process that they went through to find out their strengths. It's all about building relationships between people who didn't have relationships before. And I think this is a good uh, example of that. Oh, sorry, I went too far. There are really six different major initiatives that the church works on so that we make sure that we fill a niche and that we don't uh, do things that are already duplicated in other ways. The first one, these are probably familiar to you. Clean water. This is a a well in Kenya before a rabbit had fallen down in there and died and poisoned the well because it wasn't covered. This is the work that the community did. They fenced off to keep the animals out. They dug the pipe. They dug the line for the pipe. The church furnished the pump. We trained people in the community to repair the pump, and then they have a little income-generating thing so that they can buy new filters whenever that breaks. So it isn't so much about the clean water, although the clean water has benefits. It allows the kids to go into school. It frees up time for the women. But the the most important part of this is this water community that knows how to fix the pump, who's going to solve problems of so-and-so is taking too much water and what do we do about that. That's the most important part of that project, is the strengthening of the community. They won't let me have my job after a while if I can't push these buttons. Wheelchairs, which happens to be my initiative. There are almost 100 million people in the world who don't have mobility 
but need it. They don't have access to a wheelchair, although they need it. And so the church has worked in providing not only just wheelchairs, but different kinds of wheelchairs, rough terrain wheelchairs, cerebral palsy wheelchairs, mobility aids so that if you don't need a wheelchair, don't put yourself in a wheelchair. Uh, and all of these things allow people to go to school. They free up other members of the family who are caring for the person with disabilities to uh, work or to do other things. Vision treatment, this has to do with glasses and uh, screening and cataract surgery and providing vision screening equipment. There isn't a picture here, but one of the, my favorite stories is a doctor in the, Dominican, I mean in, the, in the DRC in Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, and she said, I was going to give up being a vision doctor because I had no resources. I have no equipment. I have no supplies. I can see the problems, but I, there's nothing I can do to help the people who come to me. The church did a project through the Ministry of Health where she was given a slit lamp and a microscope, and they were given supplies and, and uh, help to distribute those things through the area where she was working and train other people to work with her. And she finally, there's a picture of her with her microscope, and she's saying, I can finally do the work that I was trained for because I have equipment. And she said, I now believe that there's hope in my life. I didn't have any hope before, and that's the project that gave it to her. And then she passes on that hope to the other people that she works with. Neonatal resuscitation training is basically teaching birth attendants and midwives and doctors and hospitals and nurses how to revive a baby if the baby isn't breathing. And there are some easy things to do. You know, you can rub the baby, you can stimulate them, you can uh, get them warm, you can uh, hold them. And then at the very end, you may have to use a bag and a mask, you may have to intubate. But really, 90% of the babies can be revived if you just do those basic things with the blanket and the stimulation. This is a, a project in Thailand. What I love about this picture, this is the training that was going on. And this, this is this woman right here. So it's a two-day training. And she, in the middle of that training, in the middle of the night, was called to deliver this baby. And she used the techniques that she'd used in the training and revived this baby. But what I love is that she's there for this picture and that look on that mother's face. You save a baby and you've saved you've saved a lot of other things that go along with that. And that's the most important part. That training is just a vehicle for this community to become stronger and know how to save their children, which is exactly the way we would feel about saving our children. The church partnered with the World Health Organization to do measles vaccines. Uh, over time, I think they've done 9 million sets of inoculations. What I like about this picture is this volunteer from the church who's, it's only going to hurt for a second, we all know that, but she, and she's been doing thousands of them all day long, but she holds that little boy because it's the only shot he's going to get and he's scared, and I, I love that. As part of this, the church mobilizes wards and stakes to go door to door, to tell people about the campaign, to encourage them to bring their children, to answer questions that they may have about that, and they, they do it all just volunteer, and it takes a ton of time away from people who could be working or doing other things uh, to basically get food for their families. These are done in communities where people don't have a lot of free time. But members of the church are willing to do that so that the inoculations take place. Finally, the Benson Agriculture Institute, which used to be part of Brigham Young University, has now come under uh, humanitarian services. And they teach farmers how to get greater crop yield. This is in uh, Cambodia. He's showing the difference between his rice crop they work with, with uh, communities over a long period of time because agriculture cycles take a long time. You don't just go in there and, and solve something quickly and then go out. I've been talking a little bit about the, mich the, the audiences that we work with, and the biggest audience is community for humanitarian work. But there are other audiences as well. And these are missionaries busy doing their community work, like I said. Uh, there are donors. One of the, the, question, the stories that I like to tell is uh, there was a couple up in Utah State. The husband was going to school at Utah State, and he somehow came into a, a little inheritance of $12,000. And he decided, he and his wife, they wanted to donate that to LDS Philanthropies. And so a representative from LDS Philanthropies drove up to Logan, and he's got the address, and he's driving into these little streets, and there's this little brick house, and he knocks on the door, and they have him come in and sit down. He's looking around. The carpet is full of holes, and he recognizes this family has lots of uses for this $12,000, and he's a little bit curious about why they're donating it. But the man comes in, and they're sitting down, and they're telling the story, and they have two or three little kids. And he said, when I was a missionary in Argentina, 
a family asked me to come and administer to their baby. The baby couldn't breathe. It was rasping. And I laid my hands on the baby's head, and in the middle of the blessing, the baby suffocated and died. He said, we weren't able to save that baby, and it's just haunted me for such a long time after that. He said, just recently, in between uh, conference sessions, I saw that story that Carol Makita did about neonatal resuscitation training. And I recognized that if that family had had access to somebody who could help that baby breathe, it would have made all the difference in the world. And we just received this money, and my wife and I looked at each other, and we just decided, this is what we're doing with the $12,000. And they donated it. Now, that is a wonderful donation, and it will help a lot of neonatal resuscitation training. But the best part about that story is it also healed that man who, through his adult life, had been haunted by what had happened there. And this was a way for him to come to some kind of resolution and feel like he was doing something to help. And a big part of that was the story that Carol Makita told in between conference. Not because the church needs the publicity for the donations to come in, because the fantastic thing about members of the church is they'll donate to the humanitarian fund whether there's any media publicity or not. But because of that story, he was able to do this that healed his life. And that was a good uh, story to tell and an appropriate story to tell. There are many times that people want to volunteer. They can't serve a full-time mission. Uh, they're, they're, they've got things going on in their lives that prevent them, but they, they feel moved by their commitment, and they want to do something to help. But because of the kinds of stories that we sometimes generate in the church magazines and the church newspapers and things that they've read, they have an expectation that they will be going to exotic places and giving stuff away to people who are suffering. And if you think about the things that maybe you have thought about doing in your life, how many of them involve leaving where you are and going someplace else? And we, we perpetuate that because of the kinds of stories that we tell. But I have seen the most successful volunteers are people who recognize that I can be more effective doing this in my own community where I'm going to stay, where I will be around long term, where I understand the culture, and where I speak the language. And it's not exotic, and we often don't think about it, but this is where we can have the most impact in our own communities. This is a picture of my neighbor, Connie Colley. She's doing music at Edison Elementary, which has 26 languages going on, and their student body population turns over twice during the school year. It's so transient. And she volunteers to teach music down there, and that's part of being involved in the community. And that works because she lives in that community, and it's part, and she stays there, and she has relationships with the teachers, and, and it continues to go on year after year, not just coming in quickly, giving stuff away, and then leaving. Because that only solves a problem for about that long. And none of these issues that are going on, if you want to talk about a slow burn chronic problem, giving stuff away in, a, in an exotic location just doesn't last very long. We need to work on longer-term solutions, and they have to do with where we are and where we live. Humanitarian projects are very conscious of helping church members, wherever they live, start doing community work. For years, we sent all kinds of hygiene kits into Israel and Palestine and the West Bank, and finally we said, there's, there's BYU students that are living for six months at the Jerusalem Center, and there's the Tel Aviv ward. Why don't they buy those things locally and put those kits together and, and partner with the Maronite sisters and the, and the Palestinian Brotherhood and you know, all of these different things and do that work together as a community? And that's the new uh, effort that the church is making. Finally, I bring this up because uh, there is a great audience that the church has with government officials and NGOs and partner agencies that we work with. Last October, I happened to be sitting next to the governor of Irbid in Jordan, and we had just attended a water ceremony where the community had divided their community center in half, and this half was just a big cement room, and they tiled it, and they washed it, and they put in divisions and partitions, and they, the church hired a contractor, and he came in and put in these seven filters and reverse osmosis, and they started treating water so that it would be clean for the community. And then the community went to the governor and said, we need a vehicle because we're going to sell big bottles of this for 50 cents and we'll use the money to replace the filters. So they have this great project going. He sat next to me at lunch and he said, this is such a great project, we want to do another one. We're going to re rehabilitate gray water and we're going to use it to water gardens and we'll increase nutrition and we'll bring income generations to these, these apartment buildings using their gray water. He and he said, as an inducement to the church to participate, he said, we're going we're gonna to have a big plaque we're going to put on the side, of, and we're going to say, 
LDS Charities Church of Jesus Christ America helped us do this project. And I've seen a lot of these kinds of plaques, and I've seen the mistakes that come from that. Number one, what happens if this is on the side of the building? Who owns that building? Who feels responsible for the project? Well, it's not the community, <laughs> because they came hat in hand begging to this charity organization who then gave them this, this project. And when they need help again, they're going to come hat in hand begging and see if somebody else will do it. And in return, they give them this big plaque. And I also happen to know that you, know, you go to those buildings, and sometimes there are, they're quit working, and the water's all contaminated, and the building's all falling down, and there's this big plaque that says, thank you to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is also the story we don't want to tell. So he and I sat down, and we started sketching, and this is the, the plaque that we came up with, which follows those principles and is the story that we want to tell. It's owned by the Makeba Township, and it's maintained <coughs> by the Mafrak Hills Water Committee. And if we have... The partner's logo's on the side, fine. But this is the mo main story of that. And this is the story we ought to tell more of. And I think we ought to highlight in the media stories of people volunteering in their communities and stories of communities taking charge of their problems and finding a resource and a solution and then maintaining it over time. I think those are the stories that we ought to try and highlight. At the end of all of these the church will hold what's called a closing ceremony. That's what I was attending at that water ceremony. But we'll do it at wheelchairs, and we'll do it at, at uh, these neonatal resuscitation trainings with these doctors. We have this closing ceremony. And people will often ask me, why are you having that closing ceremony? Is, is it just for publicity? But there are really three main reasons. Number one, we want people to know what was donated so that everybody in the community recognizes. You see that big water tank? It belongs to the community. And if it disappears, that's a loss for the whole community. So it's for transparency. That's number one. The second reason is we want church members and community members to have a chance to get to know each other and to interact and to have a social event. And the third reason is we want to celebrate the work that the community did. All that tiling, all of that ditch digging, they worked hard to get that done, and they deserve to be celebrated for it. And so, again, it's part of building that infrastructure in the community. The final thing that I thought I would just talk about is why, why do we tell some stories and why do we not? And I hope that the point is made, we will continue to do this work whether there's media attention or not. And hopefully the media attention that is generated as a byproduct remains in its rightful place as a byproduct. And we don't use it, we don't use it in a way that drives the kinds of work that we do because it should always remain as a byproduct. And I hope that we share at appropriate times the stories of the people themselves, the stories of what they did to become more empowered. It's more about the community than it is about the outside input. Uh, and I hope that through that, governments and other communities will be proud to work with the church and recognize that we're a, we're a credible partner, that we have people who are willing to give without any expectation for return, and that we will stay when other people have gone. I hope that we don't ever allow the story and telling the story to get in the way of acknowledging when we make mistakes, that we don't have to edit everything to be so uplifting that we, we miss out on what we learn out of that. I was so grateful to a, a documentary that was put on by B Brigham Young Television. I, I think it was Sterling Van Wagner who was the producer of it, but it was called Acts of God. Has anybody seen that? It highlights humanitarian work in such a good way because it focuses on missionary work the way missionary work really is. They show some of the heartbreak. They show some of the things that don't work out. They show some of the people we weren't able to help. And anybody who served a mission knows that's exactly what happens. And when we are able to acknowledge some of the hard things, we don't have to edit everything to be so uplifting, then we can talk about the realities and how we can do it better and what can we do next time. And if we don't learn from those kinds of lessons, if we don't take the opportunity to do those things, if we're always worried about the image and the media, then I think we, we really hurt ourselves and we allow the media images to drive the work rather than the other way around. I just wanted to close by saying that with or without media attention, the greatest story of all is being written in the hearts of the people who participate. And it doesn't... Th these lives and the things that they do prove to people beyond any story that they'll ever read or any, anything that will ever be on the radio it's their lives that show that they are Christians 
and that they uh, do things for the right reasons and that they're actually living their religion. And that's a very powerful motivator to anybody in the world in any circumstance. And that's really the principle that drives everything else that we're doing. There are reasons that we tell our stories and there are reasons that we don't tell our stories. And I hope that we're wise enough to know some of the, the reasons behind that. I, I have uh, spent 10 years trying to understand the principles behind that and I hope to continue to learn more. But I appreciate the interest that uh, the Kennedy Center has in these kinds of things, in teaching students through development programs and helping students have good experiences when they go out uh, into the world through their missions, through their uh, connections with their mission field afterward and for all the things that they, they love to do in the world because of the spirit of volunteerism that is in our hearts as members of the church. I want to bear my testimony that I'm so grateful to belong to a church that will take on the whole world and be responsible for helping people progress, whether they are members of the church or not members of the church, and uh, using the doctrines and the examples of our lives to help people progress, which is a truly Christian thing. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. There is some time. Would anybody like to ask any questions? Go ahead. Um, hello. Um, uh, my, one of my, my question is, I mean, if, if you look at kind of the the history of, of um, development and humanitarian aid, um, I think you can point out a lot of cases where um, whatever organization that went into the community to help it undermines some aspect of the, that community's social structure or um, whether it be a, a, you know, a, the community's a, um, hierarchy or authority or, or you sure. know, gender roles or whatever. How does the church ensure that those types of occurrences don't take place when they go into certain communities? and set up like a water well or, or something that's supposed to create efficiency in the community? It's a very good question because in, in an effort to help, sometimes we undermine the community. One of the best examples I can think of is in an effort to provide good wheelchairs, we buy them at the cheapest price, which is $55 out of China. Nobody can compete with that. And then we import them into a community that can't repair them because the parts come from China. We've driven all the local people out of business, and suddenly there's a bunch of wheelchairs that only last a year, and then they break. And what do we do? So we've, we've tried to help, and we've undermined the community instead. So moving away from that model, the church is now uh, helping to develop regional manufacturing of wheelchairs, for example, where they provide jobs for the community and for people with disabilities. They're easily repaired, and they provide an ongoing support in that community rather than driving local producers out of business. We're trying to move away from that model. There's still lots of work to do. But the, everybody recognizes what's happened in the past and trying to move toward that. So I appreciate that question. It's actually a very astute question. Right here. When you're dealing with those that make decisions, do you see any other initiatives in the future being added to the six that you've mentioned? That's a very good question. Uh, the model that they use for neonatal resuscitation training and also for vision is basically you've got a champion in the, in the community who wants to do certain things but needs resources. The church supplies some of those resources and peer training so that there's some kind of training that goes on and then they follow up and continue these relationships afterwards. But those aren't, those aren't limited to neonatal resuscitation training or vision. So they have uh, anticipated maybe doing audiology, uh, asthma treatment, some of those other medical kinds of things that could follow that same model, which has proved to be so successful. What about dentistry? dentistry has not been on the list. It's been talked about a lot, but I haven't heard anything. There are a lot of good organizations who do dentistry, which the church kind of parallel partners with, including the LDS Academy of Dentists. Quick question about uh, microcredit. Is that, is that something that LDS Humanitarian Aid is involved with? And if not, um, what are the reasons not to be involved with that? Microcredit is... Uh, the agency that works with microcredit is through LDS Employment Services because they're working with people that are either starting businesses or, or uh, getting jobs. And 10 years ago, the church thought, maybe we ought to start a microcredit uh, in the same way that we've done PEF. There are reasons why we haven't, and you can probably think of them. Number one is it's very difficult to have your bishop talk to you about church things and also talk to you about repaying your loan. Uh, and so the church is trying to maintain a, a good distance between microcredit providers and church structure. And the other reason is, wow, that's not what we do best. And there are lots of good microcredit organizations who do that. So the compromise that they came to was, we will go out and find out who are the good microcredit providers in the, in the community. We will refer members of the church to them and let them make their own connection with the microcredit. Now, some of that's uh, successful and some of it isn't. 
one of the things that I heard when I was in Kenya was, oh, we don't need any microcredit because uh, the church gives us welfare aid. And that's, that's a system that says we've got to work on our welfare program with the bishops and the state presidents there. That's a very good question. There was a question down here that I missed. I was just going to make a comment about the New York Times article during the Katrina problem where the New York Times, we read it with interest, it said the first two organizations there to help were the LDS Church and the Mormon Church. you got to love that. <laughs> I've heard that so many times. People love that quote, and it's a great quote. <laughs> Any, anybody else? Well, well another thing, of the, the same way, many government agencies aren't allowed into certain countries, and the church can get into those places because it is not affiliated with any government agency. Therefore, is that a big part in what you try and, try and do and work with? Does that yeah. ever come into play? Yeah, one of the reasons that the, ch the church can uh, participate in so many uh, different places is because it's not just a North American church, we actually have a congregation in Myanmar or we have a, you know, we have a branch that's meeting in, in different places where they may not allow Americans to come in, but they will certainly allow the international church to come do work. And so it's more because of that. But it also has to do with the relationships we've developed over time with governments, from President Hinckley on down, meeting them, touring with them, helping them get to know what the church is about and why we're doing the things that we do. Do, do you have a follow-up question? Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, we have a lot of people in our students who are interested in getting involved in development and volunteer for volunteer. Um, should they come and talk to you? <laughs> uh, they should talk to who's the right person at the Kennedy Center? We'll, we'll do employment services with that, so you know. Our, Aaron Rose would be a good one also. Okay. Uh, the, the best uh, thing that we have done with Brigham Young University is the Employment Resource Service internship. So you go to a place where you speak the language, you go for six months, you get school credit, is it three months? Three months you get school credit and you teach the career workshop or the self-employment workshop to, uh, you either help towards the stakes get it going or you teach it yourself at the employment center. It's a wonderful program, it changes people's lives, it gives the student a great opportunity to do something new. I was involved with that with Landis Holbrook for four or five years. I, I'm the greatest proponent in the world of it. But I wish we had more things like that between the church, welfare department, and BYU. With uh, Proposition 8, some of the critiques that I've seen of people, people who have come out and they've said, well, why are you Mormons spending all your money on this? Why aren't you giving to the needy and the poor and so forth? And, and of course, those of us who are members of the church are aware that we do. But what's the best short answer to give to people like that, to just kind of put it in perspective uh, rather quickly uh, besides just coming out and say, yes, yes, we do? Is the question, what's the short answer about the humanitarian aid that we give or about why we were against Proposition 8? No, no, uh, certainly not about why we were against Proposition 8. It's, it's, it's how, do you, how do you sort of Four. balance it and tell them, look, you may think there was a lot of money that went into Proposition 8, but comparatively, there's so much more and so much more of our time and effort and our resources that go into humanitarian aid and taking care of other kinds of problems around the world. My own experience is people respond best to a really specific example. And so I, I would develop an example that happened in my community where the church and church members did something. And I would tell about that. And then say, in relation to this, in cities all over the world, these same kinds of activities happen. We don't talk about them very often because we're, we're trying not to, I mean, it's not about getting attention for the church, but we believe in being community citizens, and these are the kinds of things that we do. And it's millions of dollars every year. Church won't talk about how much it is, but it's millions of dollars every year. Thank you for having me. I love coming to BYU, and I love being at the Kennedy Center. I appreciate your uh, interest in this, and I, I hope to maybe come back again. Thank you. Thank you.